Oh, hello there, Chuck. <laughs> I didn't see you there. How are you? Hmm? Good. Just uh, editing the episode. What's up? <laughs> What's up? Oh, you commoner and your common talk. I guess I'm what you would say, <laughs> doing not much. <laughs> what is this? Chuck. Chuck, it's me, your pal Brady. I'm practicing patronizing, so I'm working on being more condescending to people. <laughs> oh, Ooh. do you have any idea my man can get some crumpets around here? <laughs> uh, wh- why are you doing this? You know, for our Patreon, we've been asking people to patronize our page, and I didn't want to ask them to do something I wasn't willing to do it myself, so I figured I'd get some practice. In. Oh, God. Brady, no, that's, huh? uh, that's what? not what it means. Oh, no? Listen. Listeners can go to our Patreon page, pick the level you want to contribute. Each level has special rewards. Okay. Like exclusive life after minisodes. Or not safe for work bloopers? Uh, Or like a monthly collection of deconstruction memes. And even personal consultations or meet up with your favorite host, Chuck and Brady? Yeah. Brady. Patreon.com slash the life (laughs) after. I guess even you could find it. (laughs) All right. <clears throat> Welcome to The Life After. I'm Chuck Parson. And I'm Brady Harden. And we are The Life After. <laughs> That's right. Welcome to The Life After. Um, we are here today with uh, a new friend of ours. Yes. <laughs> what are you looking at me for? <laughs> the host of, because my brain's working slowly. That's why. No, you're fine. Uh, <laughs> the host of Everyone's Agnostic. Uh, we're here with Cass Midgley. Say hey, Cass. Hey, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Man, you got such a great radio voice. You do. Mm-hmm. It is so good. It's so. <laughs> who does you. the intro? Who does like the intro for your show? Is it? Is that you? Well, there's like, like the oh the, the action, music. The uh, voice. No, that's a guy out of California. He's literally a voiceover guy. But okay, I I was like, I think he paid a voiceover guy. Uh, well, I'm like he, man, it, he's so my my ex. You know, the guy that used to be my co-host, Bob Pondillo. Uh, was a radio DJ in New York City, like through through the seventies and stuff. Because he's he's like sixty three now. But um, anyway, he's got connections all over LA and New York of of, of great voices, and uh, you know, he did that for free. <laughs> oh, nice! Oh, cool! Very nice! Very nice! Actually, I don't even use it anymore because um, we changed hosts and co hosts and, oh, and right, everything. Right, right, so yeah. I I, gotcha. I just scrapped it. Yeah, you just yeah, you got to move on. But that was point. just this week, as recent as this week. Uh, you know, we I got rid of it. Oh, okay, okay, Whoa. cool. I was thinking because I was like, oh, I was listening to a recent episode, or at least what I thought was a recent episode. But to be honest, the Apple Podcast app is not the best, so I, I guess it's. <laughs> I well, could have so, been listening so to it for four years. I had I Bob Pondillo on, and he he's uh, you know that that lifelong atheist uh, was right. Um, just intrigued with the whole journey of not only Christianity but ex Christianity. And then he moved out of state, and uh, a young woman that was a former guest of the show uh, approached me, and she was like, "Let's, can I help in any way? And it was mostly yeah. like with my social media. Uh-huh. And, and then, um, I don't know if you've ever done this with your people, but I mean, like your listeners, but after four and a half years, I mean, there was a lot of community. We also have a, oh, a yeah. couple of, of uh, secret Facebook groups, and cool. They were all like, we've got to get together. We've got to meet IRL, yeah. you know? You're right, right, right. Ooh, for and sure. um, so, you know, somebody had to do it. And so, like, a, a dear friend of mine here in town, we put together the plans to rent a four-story cabin in the Smoky Mountains of East Tennessee that sleeps 40 people. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> wow. Okay. So it's not just hotels where you can go off to your corner. Like this is living together for a weekend, and right, right, right. And, and everybody there. I mean, you know, except for myself and some of the more local Nashville people, had never met each other face to face. It was so it was really brave, really scary, very cool, and triggering for because just just the, the it reminds you of sure. your retreats. It's a, yeah. it's a yeah, retreat. Yeah. It's a weekend yeah. retreat with Christians. Uh, you know, so. In fact, one of the chants there was there. They started a chant, and it said, um, "We are not a cult, and Cass is not our leader. We yes. are not a cult." I love that. I was gonna, you know, I was gonna make a cult joke and and a cult leader joke, but I was like, "Ah, yeah, whatever." 
It's well, too it, it's low hanging fruit, but I'm glad that they, <laughs> they had a chant for well, it. Well, honestly, and, he, and we even did a check in where we're sitting in a living room around you know kind of a circle, and we go around and introduce yourself and you know say where you're from and you know yeah. how you found the show. And it, it was that weekend that I, I met face to face this young woman that want, wanted to help, and turns out she didn't wasn't just about helping with social media. She's really sharp and a great communicator, and so I brought her on as a co-host. And Very cool. we're only about two uh, two episodes in that's to awesome. that, but it's going to be fascinating and, because and the first name? first thing she said was, "Well, first of all, I need to know if you're if you're big enough for me to call you on your shit live on the air." <laughs> right, oh. right, right, right. Yeah, there you go, Chuck. And, Man, yeah, that's, am I? Can I call you, we, you on your shit? Every episode we call each other on your shit on the air. Actually, Chuck, if you had to replace, like, let's say I died, I got shot by a sniper. Yeah. Which former uh, guest would you bring back as a host? <laughs> um, I'm gonna go with. Uh, I'm gonna go with probably Kristen. She'd be a good oh, Kristen oh, Hoffer. Yeah, that would, she would she'd be, be a good, good. co-host, and yeah. she's local. Mm, Shout out point. Kristen Hoffer. Anyway. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry we, we interrupted sweet. you to have a, a well, staff meeting we like to fantasize about me dying often so <laughs> that's we could joke. do a really dramatic finale if Brady died <laughs> so her, her name's marie delafont she's 36 cool. years old Very good. and she's polyamorous she is cis and straight uh-huh. Um, but she's very much a feminist. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm yep. 52, lifelong patriarch. <laughs> right, you know, right. Of course. You know, I, I, it's funny. I felt Boo. like that I was always on the progressive end of that shit because sure, as far sure. as like, I never asked my wife to submit to me. Um, however, I can, you know, I know, and she would be, if she was sitting here, she'd, she'd bring it up. There were times in our marriage where we were trying to make a big decision and... The buck stopped with me, and I probably, uh. I probably pulled that card, you know, as far as like, you know, I'm the man of the, of the house, and I wear the pants and all that shit. So I have patriarchy, uh, like, s- just in my bones from, you know, 50 years. My mom and dad were just, the, you know, the, the typical, uh, she was a stay-at-home mom, you know, mm. and, and my dad worked hard, and he was a banker and everything. They, they weren't very religious, but the, it's just the structure. It's the way things were. It was leave it to Beaver, you know. And um, sure, sure. Yeah. And yep. so anyway, I've got I've got so many fucking blind spots about this shit that mm-hmm. that every time I open my mouth, it's a minefield that I know I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> fuck up. And right, when it's just right, right. with just Bob and I on the air, I mean we're both we're both old white straight men you know that just right. we're just tromping all over these minds and the listeners are going shut up you fucking misogynist you know or whatever <laughs> right and so right. by by bringing her into the studio and actually she's not in the studio she's she's in minneapolis and i'm in okay. nashville so <laughs> right but but by bringing her onto the show she's like look uh, if i'm coming on i've got to know and i know this word gets stretched a lot but th- it's a safe place for me to call you right. on your shit that you you got you're going to be able to handle it sure and mm, uh, cool. and it, are you that guy basically and mm-hmm, she she's mm-hmm. like cuz if you're not i don't want to be on your show you know no, i yeah. like her yeah oh, i yeah. like her but yeah. but she'd been listening that, to the show like. long enough to know that i probably was that guy you know to approach mm. me at all but yeah. um yeah, so that's been an interesting turn in in the show. So you, so you, a, a little bit of your background, right? Is like you, you effectively, in so many ways, grew up in church. You became a pastor. Yep. You spent you spent some years doing that. How did if your parents weren't super religious? How did you wind up super religious? Yeah, so I was raised Presbyterian, and it was just a very liberal Presbyterian, and. Um, I got recruited by the Baptist, and it was not hard because they had a much more vibrant youth ministry than than the Presbyterians Whoa. did, and they needed a drummer for their little praise team, and uh-huh. I was okay. I was a drummer, and I would have been about eleven years old when they first started recruiting me. Um, wow. And as I went over there, and I sat a prodigy, you know, I started going, you know, against a little bit of a rebellion. I started going to to their church on Sunday mornings, where my where my family went to the Presbyterian. Mm-hmm. And after a while, I started to feel really superior to the Presbyterians because they did not take serious the threat of eternal hell. Mm. And and it was like, you guys, are don't you know what's at stake here? We need to be knocking on every door in this town. And this is a little rural, 1,500 population, one stoplight town. And so the urgency and the righteousness 
of you you guys are lukewarm and I, you know spit you out of my mouth and just the whamsy pamsy nature of their you know flimsy religion this was this was macho in a way you know to like i, I i'm not ashamed of the gospel and you know if, if i deny him before men you know all this stuff that kind of calls you like a football team you know to like let's go and, and beat each other's shoulder pads right and right whereas, whereas the presbyterians were just wimps and so that that got me you know a fire in my bones and then that church split over the gifts well i went with the gifts because the youth pastor was one of the guys promoting the spiritual gifts and he was very charismatic oh, God. Well, oh the you church. had a you had a gift split that's a good one that's a good topic to sp- <laughs> i love i love the top like the different topics the church has split over oh, but yeah. spiritual gifts of all things <laughs> Like, that's some... Well, it was whether or not the gifts were still alive, like a John yep. MacArthur versus. Yep. Okay, but yeah. here's my What's question: that? If that church, if that city that you're in was that small, like how big could this split have been? Uh, it was probably a church of a hundred people, so it was fifty-fifty. I mean, literally fifty-fifty split. 50, 50, okay. Literal, 50, 50. literal fifty-fifty split. Wow. But when I I got at uh, high school and I went, I was a jazz drummer and I went to this <laughs> jazz camp. And there was cool. a guy there, he was my age, and I think we were probably like <laughs> 17 or 18, and he was so, quote-unquote, on fire, right? You know, this was mm-hmm. just like, mm-hmm. he that showed term. me Sweet Comfort Band, he sh- you know, he showed me okay. some, some really good music. He himself was a musician, I was a musician. So we started writing songs together. We, we, uh, we lived about two hours from each other in Oklahoma, so after that week of camp, I just went home and just realized, in a way... Like the bar kept getting raised for me because you know the Presbyterian to Baptist was like, "Come on up," and then the Baptist to Pentecostal was like, "Oh, I'm mm. even, I'm even deeper. I'm really in. You know, uh-huh. I'm I'm going into the inner circle of Jesus Himself. You know, I mean, like the more I, I give and the more He takes, and and this this guy came along and showed me that I still had like I wasn't radical enough, right? And so right. I just yes. you know I just kept turning it up and. We yeah. ended up forming a band together, and I just I got to the place where, and 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 again, I know you, your listeners and yourselves have probably had to work through a lot of self shaming because it's like, oh yeah, you know yourself, you know, like I know I'm I'm semi intelligent, I know that I have you know eyes, I mean I've got wherewithal, I, I've got things, talents, and yet I just my I just, I feel like I just got completely hijacked. And yeah, yeah. and I, I just nothing mattered to me, but populating heaven. Nothing right, mattered, right. but mm-hmm. what the Lord wanted. And I wanted to be a man after God's own heart. And that was my entire identity, was wrapped up in that. And and so you know, uh, I think I, I think your question was you know how did you get you know from yeah the, all those years of ministry. And, uh, you know, but I think there was always a remnant of, like, wait a second. And then I, I've said this before, uh, obviously, on my show and on other shows that I've been on, and I don't know if anybody else has felt this, but I, I, know, I honestly, one thing that kept me in was I, I, as a senior in high school, I went on a musical trip to Europe. And so we, were, we stopped in London, in Paris, in Rome. And we're, everywhere we went, we were singing in cathedrals and stuff, and St. Peter's and Notre Dame. Mm. And, cool. like, these are fucking breathtaking buildings, man. Yeah, and, and, definitely. And, and, and what, what technology did they have? I mean, it's right. almost like the pyramids of Egypt. How'd they get those it's rocks a, it's up there? Pretty, yeah, there's some pretty Anyways. amazing cathedrals. It's, yeah. it's mind-blowing. And all of this, all of this... Was, was done, inspired by, and as a tribute to... Jesus and Christianity. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, I I've been to you know I was in even when I was in seminary. Now this is after I'd already left. But if we know this, I knew this was true all along. And that was, uh, oh, I worked in Christian bookstores for one thing. But yeah, uh, all, us oh, too. Yeah, different ones. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, all the books, all the books, and not just like the books uh-huh. that are that are popular, but the yeah. scholarly books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Those were the ones that got me, yeah. A book two inches thick that yeah. was entirely on the Gospel of of John. Or John, maybe yeah. even right, maybe yes. even maybe even John five two. You're right, yeah, oh, yeah. Jesus. A five hundred page treatise on John five two. Wasn't um so 
uh, John Piper and N.T. Wright got into like a feud over substitutionary atonement. Oh, yeah. Which I'll have to, I'll have to ask you. You mentioned substitution, substitutionary atonement. Um, I'll have to ask you about that later. But there is uh, like John Piper wrote this rebuttal for, um, I think, uh, N.T. Wright's like a Christus Victor person or something. I'm not sure. But N.T. Wright responded with like an 800 page tome. <laughs> On, on atonement yeah. it's like guys come on just talk it out it's half the well, size that, of the bible yeah. <laughs> but, and so the fact that you guys are laughing is that's just like you've you've seen the light because oh, yeah I, I did not i i just couldn't laugh at it it was like all I, oh yeah at this, the time there's, i thought it was amazing there's no yeah, we're, we're way five years is, removed there's no way that this is much ado about nothing this is this there has to be something Something here, and the fact that I'm doubting it, and yet mm-hmm. all these books and all these cathedrals have been built. There's, you know, how can all of these people be wrong and little old me right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. You know what? It finally hit me with that is I realized, oh, yeah, that's what I expected everybody else to realize about themselves. You know what I mean? Like, I wanted everyone else to change their minds and realize that oh, they've had yeah. it all wrong, but yeah. I was. I was like, I didn't have the willingness to do the same thing to myself. Uh, so, you know, um, yeah. you, oh man, so many good points came up in your, what you, your response to that question. Um, I've noticed that it seems to be kind of a theme this season as we record that, um, I, I really like the way Jamie said it in season one. She said, my relationship with Christianity was a series of escalating dares mm. and like that Arrested Development episode with Amy Poehler. And, um, and it sounds like to me like something that that seems to resonate with a lot of our guests is that we were always looking for somebody that was more of what we thought was valuable in christianity right, right so like right. that's why we got re- that's like why i got really into shane claiborne is like oh cool vow of poverty mm-hmm. like this is like yep. you know he's really doing it and you were you know you were following this like leader oh, yeah. that was like no we need to be door to door every day like this is a big thing you the know the furthest i went was a uh his name was charles Leiter, and he is the uh, mentor of Paul Washer. Who yeah, was yeah, I was pa- going to ask about, I was mention small, Paul Washer. Who's a pastor of a small church in Kirksville, Missouri. Oh, like boy. to the point where I w- almost moved to that small town so that I could like, he was like Bilbo Baggins in my head and he mm-hmm. was like the most spiritual. And I look back and I just laugh at that. You may have never made stuff. it out, Brady. I <laughs> honestly may not have. That was... You were going to so, move... Um, here's a quote. You were going to move there to quote unquote sit under his teaching. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, what the fuck does that even mean what, what what am i are you a bottom <laughs> uh badoom ching versatile toppers. but um uh, okay okay good. what was uh, just so everybody knows it's been established on the air you started off as a youth pastor and you're in the ministry world like yeah what what era was that okay so what it, cd it, samples it, were you getting from zondervan in the mail yeah right? oh <laughs> well uh what is it um Mike Iaconelli? Do you guys are old enough uh, for that I, guy? Oh, yeah. yeah. Love yeah. that guy. Uh, were you a youth pastor for a while, Chuck? Like, yes. officially? Uh-huh. Okay, okay. I was, like, uh, on well, staff at a church for, like... Yeah, I, I would say that I was on staff, and I there was a while where I, unpaid, like, without the proper pay, filled the role of a youth volunteer. pastor. Volunteer, yeah. Oh, bitch, yeah. I had an office for a hot minute. Oh, um, well... well <laughs> waka yeah. waka. Well, I had I, keys to the, the church. Anyway, Cass, go on. <laughs> He's got nothing. He's yeah. got nothing. Yeah, the keys, and I had the keys, and I had office, and, and I, you know, it, for a while, it's wor- minister of music and youth, so it got, you mm-hmm. know, they're going to mm-hmm. utilize me as much as they can. But I yeah. loved it. I loved working with teenagers, and so that would have been. I, yeah, I did I mean, too. Like even when I was in Same. college, I was leading Bible studies in my dorm and stuff, and that would have been nineteen. Uh, 86, 87, and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But then I, when I got out, uh, we just we moved to Nashville from from that small town in Oklahoma, and I got involved in Belmont Church, and and mm-hmm. it's like I mean it was Michael W. Smith's church and Amy Grant, and, and okay, okay, and it was on Music Row there, and the pastor right. there, several of the pastors there, really took took me in, man. I mean, I I'm a fucking black hole of of older male attention because my father died when i was 17 and so these mm. older men were just mm. loving on me and taking and and 
I mean, there wasn't a Sunday. I mean, like, I would be talking to these guys offline. Like, we were having lunch all the time. I ended up in a prayer partnership with, with Don Finto. And there wasn't a Sunday, hardly, that they weren't quoting me from the pulpit in front of a thousand people. And so wow. they were like, and so it just became this thing that, like, Cass was always friends with these pastors. And if they ever, one time I was with Steve Mansfield, who's, who's the guy that writes the book on the, on the presidents now. Yeah, 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 okay. Yep. And I was in a car with him, and he he called me up and he said, "Hey, I'm driving to, you know, some other church, some other town, probably in Alabama or something out of state from Nashville, and I'm a guest speaker, uh, and I, I, you, you want to go along?" <laughs> so I was like, "Sure, wow. it was an honor." So you yeah, know, he and it. I rode and we talked the whole way. And honestly, I had an uncle, kind of a secular uncle. Um, that didn't know me that well, but every, when he was with me one time, uh, I was just jabber, jabber, jabber about the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, you know. And then I left the room, and he turned to my mother, his sister, and said, well, he's got a tiger by the tail. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, yeah. So it was just jabber about Jesus. And so I'm in the car with Steve Mansfield, and I'm just like, so he says, what's the Lord showing you these days, you know? Oh, God. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And so yeah, yeah. I just, I, I, it was like, I was excited about that kind of question. And so I sure. just unpacked it for like two hours. And um, we get to the, the venue, we get to the church, and, uh, you know, I just go sit in the back. He he gets, you know, he goes up front, and he literally preaches the same sermon I had preached to him in the car. No, on the way there. shut up. <laughs> he he so, plagiarized you. He was getting his material. He was like, you I'm... You got Mark driscoll <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Is the, who, Mark Driscoll, the Dane Cook of the preaching world. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me that's not completely accurate. By the way. Mark Driscoll is like would be the type to make a rape joke. You oh, absolutely. oh, absolutely! Yeah, he probably has. Ugh. So, so uh, oops, go ahead, Cass. Well, no, so just you know, I was at Belmont for those years and and you know, rubbed shoulders with some exciting people. I ended up working at Star Song and sales, and then when I, uh, my wife and I had our first baby, and we moved back to Oklahoma, and that was in nineteen eighty. Uh, what was that? No, 1998. Okay. Maybe. And, <laughs> uh, and because I'd come from Nashville, because I'd come from being actively involved in a youth group where, you know, the, the children of the stars, you know, were in my youth group. And, um, and I, I was, you know, I'd, I'd honed my musicianship. You know, I went from being just a drummer to a guitarist and pianist and worship and stuff. So sure. I go back to this little small town in Oklahoma and I literally introduced contemporary Christian worship, you know, to that town. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In in 1998, like I said, and so it just be, it was a very exciting time. And again, <laughs> just got just all in. Uh, was it was, like Pleasantville? Did you did the church turn color? Oh, <laughs> when you started? I cannot believe that you just quoted that. That's my favorite movie. <laughs> it's the greatest. It's the greatest it's great example movie. of what happens to people when they start to leave to get religion. The oh, is yeah, they yes, get color yeah. in their face and they masturbate <laughs> off, in their bathtub. <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Yeah, uh, if you want to learn more about masturbating in your bathtub, season one, uh, at Renee's episode. Yes. Yeah, listen to that. Uh, actually, <laughs> a, we, a cautionary tale. A cautionary tale. <laughs> we, uh, we, we need to take a really quick break, uh, and when we get back, I want to hear You're going to leave me story. with that image? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> that is what we like to... You know, actually, I'm just going to take a moment of silence to let that sink in just even a little bit more we're right back right after this if you were gonna die tonight do you know where stop. you stop just tell them about our website oh just tell them to go to the lifeafter.org yes they can go now even without accepting jesus christ as their personal lord and savior <laughs> the lifeafter.org we have a blog contact page a link to our facebook page and more all right, thelifeafter.org. Heavenly. Well, welcome, welcome back, back to, to the Life, Life After. After. I'm uh, Brady Harden. I'm Chuck Parson. Hey, you know, uh, this is the first time that Chuck and I were both uh, drinking tea. We've got like little glasses here drinking tea together. We kind of look like we've got a morning show going on. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, like Morning Joe, except less Ew. racist. Yeah, actually, we. <laughs> And less in love with each other. <laughs> You're right. I only know that because of us. No, actually, will you read your? What is your little? Uh, what does your fortune say? Yours says. Uh, 
in bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Live righteously and love everyone, and you will build up around you an aura of light and love. In bed. In bed. Thank you, Thank Yogi, you Yogi T. Yogi T. <laughs> uh, the Life After brought to you by Yogi T. That's now not true. Diff- <laughs> that is not true. They are not giving us Cass, money. Uh, Cass, I have a question for you. Um, sure. So you mentioned in the last segment, you mentioned uh, your, your time traveling, singing in these cathedrals, making music in these beautiful cathedrals, right? And, and that was... The experience of of the institution and the the uh, massive you the know, juggernaut the that juggernaut is that is Christianity, right? Whether we're talking about cathedrals or institutions or music books, or libraries. tomes, right? Huge books. That's what that's part of what kept you in. But there's some some irony to that, right? Because there was a moment where you realized, wait a minute, no, that's that all of that is human effort, right? All of that what? is like comes from humanity like it comes from us as individuals and we it was a long time me getting to that point though right of course Uh, it was yeah because i mean i i think you know i think the first three pillars to fall for me was um i didn't i didn't believe in hell second i didn't believe in the inerrancy of scripture and thirdly i i stopped believing in substitutionary atonement which you know, we talk about at sure. time, but yeah, yeah. But that's that second thing is the inerrancy of scripture. I just get, you know, I just there wasn't any way to have any kind of personal integrity, and 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 like call myself an honest person if if I just was it was you know hold my nose and read the Bible and and is forced down my throat that it's like okay Jephthah kills his own daughter or you know and this is supposed to be okay. You know, and right, and just the tension, and that's another thing. I think it it get it gets it gets caught up in the human mind. All these cognitive dissonances that really they can. I think it manifests in the body in some really unhealthy ways. It makes, a, so, yeah, it makes a difference, absolutely. And so I was all in, knotted up with with these things, and I've, I've I don't know. I was reading um, Wittenberg Door at the time, and a, a relevant magazine came out about right when I was starting to. Um, you know, it, it it was part and parcel to my questioning of things, and and gave me license to question things, and and so once I started seeing that, okay, what's wrong with the Bible being written by man, humans, and fallible, and that just like, I mean, how could Paul say to everybody else, we hear in part and we prophesy in part, and yet. All 66 of these books are not heard in part and not prophesied in part. They're heard in whole, and they're prophesied in whole. Bullshit. I mean, that can't Mm. be. Right. And so I gave myself permission to say, okay, this is made by humans. Well, then, and, you know, I love this about the church and about conservative evangelicalism is that, well, it's a slippery slope. (laughs) Well, the truth is, it is a slippery slope. Yeah, right. You know what what we do when we go to water parks? We go to water parks to to ride a slippery slope because they're fun. <laughs> there we go, I like that. Yeah. So so I we go once I questioned parties. the Bible. I'm just kidding. Then I could realize that all these people, or um, you know, everybody is just spouting out stuff, and you know, I don't know. It just after a while, it seemed like much ado about nothing, and what well, you know, just just mental and and. Uh, literary gymnastics to keep yes. God alive. I've always yeah. felt like that, you know, like uh, w- w- when Christianity became, uh, I was an EMT performing CPR on Jesus every day, you know, <laughs> it's just pumping his chest, you know, and blowing in his mouth and trying to keep it alive when it, you know, it was um, um, weekend at. What's that movie where they carry weekend around the dead guy? Yeah, weekend at yeah. Bernie's. <laughs> so yeah, it did. It did eventually get to where. Um, I was able to say, you know what, I am right, and all you motherfuckers are wrong. <laughs> right, right, right. One thing I've noticed about myself whenever I was going through that, like, always having an answer for something to defend my faith, was that yeah. it, it had nothing to do about the situation as much as it did about me having just like an autoresponder. I had to say the answer, the rote answer that was kind of get this robotic, like, an email, an automated email response. Like, mm-hmm. where you send an email and you get the, like, light out, out of, of office. the office. Yeah, like, that sort of bullshit. That's kind of how my responses were. Uh-huh. That, yeah. You know, oh, I wasn't I really that, thinking yeah. um, or anything. I was just dogmatically spitting out answers because in my 
my case, I really wanted a person that I was talking to to be good. I wanted them to be safe. I wanted them to be a Christian and happy. So yep. I thought that anything in the way of that, including stopping to listen or to really question my dogma, uh, was kind of an obstacle towards that righteous yeah. goal. I mean, right? Like it was a good goal to have to care about people, right? Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. But what's that called? What is that practice called of you defending the faith and being ready in season and out? There's a, there's a fancy... Pardon? <laughs> Unproved workmen are not he said ashamed. A want <laughs> Boys but and a, girls for all right, his okay, all right. There's a big fancy word that starts with A. Oh, apologetics. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. But no, I'm no, so no, listen. Sorry. I was just thinking today, What what is an apology other than... You know, I'm sorry. <laughs> right, right, right. Sure. I'm right. sorry for what I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And and the, what <sighs> what Christianity has to do with like William Lane Craig is is roll out these people that have you know learned how to apologize for how fucked up the Bible is, how fucked up God is, and how fucked up it's it is on our lives. And so you, again, you're just keeping a dead thing alive. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. No, well, that's no, what Jesus you. is doing. He he's keeping dead. Just he's get, resurrection keeping dead joke. Alive. There it is. So, well, and there's those steps because you go from like, okay, there is, you know, I'm I believe in God. Now I now I don't believe in God. But there's really that step in the middle that says, no, I hate God, which is kind of silly and childish for a season because you know you're actually hating something that doesn't exist. That and, you right. right if you believe that and I. People get caught up on that, and I think it's it's a good phase to have. Yeah. I think you should just embrace it's it. Fine. It's fine. Oh, absolutely. It's a yeah. stage of grief. It's nice yeah. to... Yeah, I mean, it, well, kind of. it was extremely real Pure to you Seth. for a long time, and so it's more helpful to to act like it's real while you process your anger than it is to did yeah. not like slow your processing of your anger by yeah. trying to convince yourself that the entity itself is not real. It's it's just yeah. like your anger it makes will sense. as your anger processes you will stop believing in the entity naturally. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Which is great because then then you're like, "Oh, I mean, cuz there's venom in that, you know, like there's there yeah. there's you can end up like feeling um I don't know, just dirty because you're You've just crossed over from like sure. worshiping and loving God to like hating God, and then when it just goes poof up and smoke, you know that that's again kind of when the art begins. I mean, because that's when you like start to say, "Oh my God, we're just a dirt clod hurling through space, and there is no meaning that I, other than what I give my life." Oh my God! Next mm-hmm. thing you know, you're you're empowered, and that. You know, all those things that you thought were real. And I heard your episode with, with Derek Webb, and it's like, wait a second, all that time that I was, that God helped me solve problems, it was me. It was your intuition, mm-hmm. yeah. Intuition. Yeah. Yeah. It was your intuition. And, and, and instead time. of like, oh my God, that's that, that's pride. Right. You know? Right, right, right. It's, it's like, just... fuck you. I'm, I did it, and I'm good. And, you can figure you know. things out. You've got a brain. <laughs> yeah. Speaking, you said mentioned up in smoke. Speaking of up in smoke, um, hell like what a strange belief hell is right oh it's horrible it's I, the like, worst. I like that you call it the most evil thing we've ever conceived I like it is it, it, it's I, absolute... I, I don't disagree with you I just never really thought of it on those terms before it's so well, bizarre it's it's you're tortured you're lost you're dark you're separate from God I don't care what you call it but after 10,000 years you're just getting started Right. right, 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 right. Like, I don't want to so, be mean, but it's like, it kind of makes Jesus out to be a big wuss. Like, you know, he just suffered on the cross for how long, but I'm going to be there yeah. for, you know, trillions of years. Suck on right, that, dude. Right, it's right. Like, well, so it's, take it's like that. that brand new line where he says, um, this problem is going to, he's talking to Jesus. The song's called Jesus Christ. And he says, this problem is going to last more than the weekend. <laughs> 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 I've heard that. I've heard that, or at least reference to how little Jesus had to to, to do. Yeah. Um, but the the thing that uh, that makes it so weird to me is that my mom, and of course now she's ninety, um, but honestly, just pure as the driven snow, sweet, sweet, sweet lady. And how how do you get an otherwise wholesome, moral, ethical person to you know? 
I love people. I love art. I love playing with children. I love making food for people. Whatever. Um, and all. Um, and by the way, my Lord and Savior <laughs> is going to torture ninety percent of the human population <laughs> forever. And I get out of bed every day. You're right. You're right. Right. Yeah. yeah. That is yeah. some serious cogdis. That's some serious compartmentalization. Sure. What do you and think happens? Because I, we did that. We did that, right? Like, well, I, I really, I fought it all tooth and nail from the day I became a Christian. I okay. was just like, really? I, I became okay. an annihilationist pretty quick. Oh, mm. okay. I got you. Yeah. I, that, and I just, which, well, which, let's be honest, is probably a more accurate perception of how the Bible explains it anyway. You know what? It was easy for me because I, as an evangelical, John 3.16 was a core scripture that defined everything almost. Right. And it's like, whosoever believeth in me will not perish. Well, guess what? The antithesis of that is that if you don't believe in me, you will perish. Right. Mm. Yeah. So it's, yeah. You got it, us. And, and, and it makes sense because your soul is unredeemed. Your soul is corrupt. And so it's just going to it's just gonna rot. Like the only thing that takes us from an animal that, that rots in the dirt and worms eat us is 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 something supernatural has come in and regenerated our soul. So, Sorry. <laughs> the yeah, language right? was so triggering. Like honestly just hearing somebody saying like, yeah, we we're gonna experience that or you know, if we don't do this, oh, we have yeah. to we just that we just like, ugh. I the apologize. I've never uh, fake gagged at a guest <laughs> I was before. Say, I, that, that was so that's, rude. That but sound you made made up for all the terrible sounds I make into the it microphone. Just, oh, it just was kind of <laughs> no, cast that was triggering. Whew. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, that's the thing about my show is like I've got a bunch of ex Christians on there, and but they also I mean it's almost a risk they take by listening to the show because every now and then I whip into pastor mode and I, oh, I pull God. out I pull out scripture I've got like so much scripture it takes, memorized that it it's takes in there. everything in me not to do that more often than I do and I think it still drives people crazy so I, I totally <laughs> identify with that speaking yeah. of wait, speaking of pastory language uh you called you called substitution substitu- yeah, yeah I can say words substitutionary atonement a scapegoat which I thought was a really interesting language for that what do you mean by that well, so you guys know the the story of I mean it's not even like a stretch. It's it's in the Bible. I mean, where mm-hmm. they talk about, you know, putting on I mean, he's the lamb of God, right? So you you the sins of the city and the sins of the the tribe are put on theoretically like laid hands on and and then that that animal is either slit their throat or oh, they just God. kick them out into the wilderness where they'll be eaten by a mountain lion. And that is that the the, the city experiences like some kind of all right, all our sins are forgiven. Mm-hmm. Which I um, imagine, like, how's that working for you? <laughs> you know, as far as your neighbor, your neighbor raped your wife, and it's like, oh wait, don't you know that we we threw that lamb out in the woods? It's all good. And, I'm covered, man. Yeah, and th- that's the thing is that, and I know that was an emphasis um, on your talk with Derek Webb was just the lack of responsibility that we have to take as humans because mm. now that guy that raped you, you know, your sister, he's off the hook just because a lamb went out in the woods and stuff, and so. It, it is a again another way uh, of creating infantilism, mm. uh, or you know, just perpetual stunted development, mm. mm-hmm. uh, it, because you never really have to take responsibility for your own actions. Yep. You were, you were given a sin nature, so it's like, okay, I'm really not responsible for that. You were given a righteous nature, so you're not responsible for that. So who the fuck are you, and what role do you play in your own fucking existence? Right, mm. not none. It's all robbed from you. Yeah. So no yeah, wonder yeah. you can't make art. Wow. Damn. Yeah, no one you can't make art. Yeah, exactly. So I I really I really resonate that with that though because in kind of in a different way, like because I was really like very viscer viscerally aware of the fact that that was a scapegoat. So like there were instances where I I like did I did hurtful things toward people in like my church body or what like you know in my friends group or whatever and I remember having these conversations with like my pastor or whatever where I was like look I know God has forgiven me for this thing but it matters way more to me that the person that I offended hasn't forgiven me and it was sort of like like he sort of looked at me like as an indoctrinated individual looked at me like I was on fire because it was like, well, God's forgiven you. So what does it matter what the other person, you know? And I was carrying this burden around of like being unforgiven, 
you know, which is a big deal and it happens and it's totally like that person wasn't doing anything wrong by not forgiving me for whatever it was, Mm -hmm. even though they were probably being pressured to by the church. And, you know, and I, and I was like, it doesn't matter to me in this moment that God forgave me. Like I did something wrong and I'm, I'm still suffering the consequences for it, you know? Uh, well, and I think one of the things that a lot of my guests have come on, and this the word disembodiment has come up a, a few times. One one episode in particular is kind of the woman that introduced the term, and I even like I asked her to like tell me what you mean by that. And it's like it, when we distrust our own bodies, you know, not mm-hmm. only just sexually, but well, who just, was this? Who was your guest? Oh, what was her name? Was it wanna, Jamie Lee Finch? No, okay, I've never had her like, on. This sounds like Jamie Talk. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, it's, it's just, you know, your body's going to rot. Mm. Your only th- the only thing redemptive about you is your soul, your spirit, you know, all the, all the non-physical things about your person. And so your body is kind of bad. It causes you to sin. You're supposed mm-hmm. to like cut your arm off if it causes you to sort of cast your eye out. So there's right. a lot about, there's just a lot of disdain for the, for the physical body. Mm-hmm. And when, and then I'm, I'm just, uh, suspecting that maybe Chuck, that you felt it in your body, like that something mm-hmm. about you mm-hmm. was holding on to the fact that, okay, yeah, great. God's forgiven me. And I, that's great. Thank you. However, I still feel something. Mm. I, I still, there's some unfinished business here. That 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 blood has not taken mm-hmm. away, right? Yep, and yep, yep. and so you we be, begin to listen to your body, and honestly, this is what's also confusing and why you know I stayed in as long as I did and I had trouble, um, you know, letting go of God or Jesus. And that is when he said that when you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. And uh, you know, I I was a big Tony Campola fan. Now I'm a Bart Campola fan, but you know, uh, I heard a talk that Tony gave. I don't once. know who Bart is. Uh, uh, so Bart, his son. Oh, it's his son. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm, out, I'm out of touch with the Campola world. And anyway, continue yeah. your thoughts. Sorry. No, it's cool. Um, but he 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 just said, look, if you want to love God, and this is First John, it says, you say you love God, but you hate your neighbor. I tell you, you lie. Mm-hmm. And what I what I think is embedded in that statement where he says you lie, is he saying no, it's not possible. So if you think you love God and yet you hate your neighbor, it's not that you've just done a bad thing. Mm. You've done an impossible thing. Like you, you actually haven't done shit mm. because you don't. It's absolutely defined by your love for one another. How do you know you're Christians by your love for one another? So so when he said. Uh, Paul, you know, Tony Capola said that when, whenever I feed a hungry child, I'm literally feeding God. You know, mm-hmm. that whole, when did I do it, Lord? Well, when you did it to the least of these, you sure. did it to me. Yeah. So he said that God has personified himself in his, in his creations. So the earth, the, the animals, the humans, they all belong to God. And so how you treat all, all this liberal shit, you know, as far as like taking care of the earth, taking care of animals, stop eating animals. Uh, you know, these liberal policies, these were all that what I got from Jesus. Now, the reason I say all that is to say that I what I eventually got to, and maybe this was me trying to save face, and, and like you said the other day, the opposite of, of the uh, Pascal's wager. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh-huh. And that is, I think atheism is the best practice of theism. And by that, if, if we all, the whole planet, and this is kind of a John Lennon imagine thing, but if we all just ignored God, we closed the heavens off, we literally just, you know, de- determined there, there is no God, mm-hmm. everybody stop, you know, and everybody for, 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 for whatever reason buys in, and all this energy and money and time mm. that we, had, we have spent, you know, in this vertical relationship with God, right. is is now uh, in surplus, right. and so we've got money to be horizontal. We've got time and energy. We've got you know love, and so we you know the the human race forgets God, ignores God, uh, to the point where we do so good at at like loving and being human that God parts the clouds and blows a trumpet and says, well done, good and faithful servants. 
And and sure. so I wrote I wrote an essay in the early days of my of my deconversion that I just published in front of my sisters and my family and everybody just as what kind of my coming out moment. Sure. Is that it, I just said if 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 God could say anything to the human race it would be ignore me please. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, on that note, we're going to take a break. When I come back, I want to ask you about uh, your thoughts on, on community after leaving the faith and, and, uh, and how, to, how to build that and how to think about it. So we'll be right back after this. Hey, Chuck, remember tithing? Uh, you mean that thing in the Old Testament where they were supposed to give 10% of their money to the Levites that the modern church used to replace what Jesus taught about Christians giving all their possessions to the poor? Yeah, that. Well, I think I figured out a way to make it cheaper and easier. How's that? Patreon, it's an online crowdfunding tool where people can support the art they like by automatically donating monthly amounts of money. Do we have one for the life after? We do. You can go to patreon.com backslash the life after, or there's a link from our website, thelifeafter.org, under the website menu. I'll chuck it out. I'm not saying that. You have to say chuck it out. <laughs> uh, welcome back to the life after. We're here with our guest, Cass Midgley, uh, having a good old time. So Cass, um... You have some you have some really interesting important thoughts so one of the things that we talk a lot about on the show is a, a huge part of religious trauma syndrome is loss of community um, people you know they profess that they are no longer a Christian they co- sort of cross their fingers and hope that a lot of their Christian friends will like decide to stay friends with them but most of the time it doesn't happen especially when you're in more fundamentalist circles so you find yourself uh, desperately trying to, to rebuild and, and find a place in the world and um community becomes like all of a sudden this important thing that you took Mm. for granted earlier yeah so um what are your thoughts on that man well i wouldn't it's funny because i i I wouldn't say that i desperately tried to do this because it it really just kind of happened and just i mean just as a result of starting the show um that you know people heard it and then they you know they found out that the because we interview like People you don't know about a subject no one wants to talk about is kind of our subtitle. So it's it's not all like people with books <laughs> yeah. and and you know uh, things to promote. It's just regular people, most of which come on anonymous. And then they find out that they're in the same town with so so, and these these communities formed hmm. from people listening to the show and saying, "Okay, you're in West Texas. We've, there's a group that meets in Amsterdam where a person was listening." from amps you know from the netherlands heard a guest from the netherlands and then fa- became friends on facebook and now they have a meetup a monthly meetup where ex-christians are meeting and they call it the everyone's agnostic group because they met through the show That's and cute. so it was very organic and it was happening and i think you know i'm i'm a big uh fan i guess i don't know it just seems like a lot of what is human about us is like a river that is going to flow somewhere and uh, the number one thing is sexuality, obviously. But mm-hmm. the the other one is just it's just uh, fraternity and and the you know the platonic relationships. Mm. It's it's powerful, and we and we need it. And we're pack animals, and it's part of why our DNA went on and on is because we're better together. But I want to just say this for a second, and that is because one of the things that's coming out of Christianity that we kind of have to unlearn is binary thinking. And I know that we always, or there's a tendency to say, I'm an extrovert or I'm an introvert. And I've really embraced the fact that I'm very, very both, in that I hate humanity on some days and some hours of mm. the day, you know? Yes. And, one and then there's others, I love humanity. Mm-hmm. And, and I, you know, the whole thing about get energy from one or the other. I get energy from being alone and I get energy from being with people. But sometimes, that clashes to where I'm at a party and I can't wait to go to the balcony and smoke a cigarette, mm-hmm. or or I'm alone walking, uh, you know, in the woods and I can't wait to go to the the cocktail party that's happening later that night. You know, I mean, this the tension that goes on in every human being. I'm just saying that to just lay it out there as none of this is binary. Um, 
Now, to the to your question, the intentionality that I did not only so the the, the organic stuff that happened through the show, I really had nothing to do with. It was just people forming those things with or without my uh, knowledge or awareness or permission. But in my own life, um, so being being a pastor, my uh, my wife's a pastor's wife, my kids are pastor's kids, and because you know, at least two days a week, Sunday and Wednesday, if not more. There was very exciting things going on, and it's just the water we were swimming in. We didn't really even know how cool it was that, you know, every Wednesday night, my kids were crawling underneath the pews while the adults were in the, the fellowship hall eating or something. It was just fun stuff. And and then, you know, if you broke off into men's groups every now and then, or you had pickup basketball games, if the church had enough money to have a gymnasium, I mean, yeah, so there's there's community there that we miss and how now shall we live it's just another aspect of of when the bottom falls out so in my case with my own family um and especially being away from our oklahoma family out here i could tell that my wife was like i've got no roots here we could pack up and leave tomorrow and i wouldn't shed a tear Mm -hmm. and i was like wow you know and i'm enough of an introvert um to like not notice that (laughs) <laughs> you know mm-hmm. sure so that was news to me i was yeah. like oh that matters to you that we could leave and not shed a tear um funny thing about her family is that every time they ever hang up the phone from each other or leave from a gathering the the the, the goodbye itself is another 15 minutes uh-huh. tacked on sure. to the event yeah. Yeah, yeah. my family we ghost each other every time we're ever together <laughs> Literally, it's like no hugs, no goodbyes. Even like I'm picturing, a, I'm picturing a Thanksgiving table with like one cousin sitting at it, and everybody else is just like in a corner of the house or something. Yeah, <laughs> right. And so we we had different upbringings where she really uh, loved hugging people and saying goodbye for hours, and and I man, there's hardly anything more annoying. Like even just listening to her on the phone. Okay, well, all right, we'll see you. All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, fuck that. Fuck that. I mean, it's like, oh my God, I'm going to shoot myself in the head. So anyway, but when she expressed it like I've got no roots here, um, I set out on a mission. I mean, we'd already met some people through some some circumstances, you know, like people do. But the, just because you meet a couple or a, a person through whatever... Um, whether it's, um, in this case, it, there was, there was some church people, but there's also yoga, uh, or restaurant. My kids were servers at a restaurant. And so we would go to that restaurant all the time. Well, we ended up meeting like everybody there and it uh-huh. became like a cheers, cheers bar for yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. But then when it comes to ex- extracurricular or intentional stuff, like, uh, starting a book club is a great excuse. You don't mm. have to read a book; just yeah. call it that, and you right. sound smart. Right, right, right. Um, and and then we we'd said so. I did. I said I started a book club, and I sent out that creepy email that says, "I want to be friends." <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and you have to put yourself. It's out a vo- there it's and- a vulnerable. Sp- I like that voice you use because you do feel vulnerable and tiny and squishable <laughs> when you do that. Well, right, see. you're like, well. If they don't like this, I'm going to be squished. Like I'm. Yeah, gonna, you know, and I, and, but you know, love is vulnerable, and so it's a wonderful it thing. Is. And you know, the people responded um, that I invited. And they were like, uh, and they were kind of like, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm going to come to the first one, you know, type thing. And so, I, I'll, just to give you some logistics and like where rubber re- meets the road, there is a way to create community that is not so organic that it's actually intentional and there's an agenda and this this is what's funny about this type of stuff people say they hate it but when they go home that night in their car they are like so grateful for how deep the meeting went as opposed to just schmoozing Mm -hmm. and so here's how we do it at six o'clock uh it's bring a top uh, an appetizer Mm -hmm. it's bring it's bring some kind of finger food and we put it all out. Everybody's making drinks, if you drink or whatever. And from 6 to 7, it's just a social hour. Mm-hmm. It's happy hour. But at 7 o'clock, and they call me the timer Nazi, <laughs> uh, at 7 o'clock sharp, I literally call everybody, all right, let's gather up. It's your pastor, your inner pastor there. It's my pastor so stuff, going. you know. Okay, guys, yeah. let's get together. 
Well, and and the thing Time is, is started. they're all grumbling. Uh, they're all yep. fucking grumbling. Always. They're all like, okay, and they got to stop their conversation or wrap it up. And so we end up in a living room type situation. And I look, you know, I basically count the number of people in the room, and I divide sixty minutes by that, and just kind of give a buffer between each talk. And so it usually ends up being anywhere from two to four minutes a piece. And I literally have a timer. And so instead of like, sometimes we do popcorn, but sometimes it's more often than not, it's it's left to right. And so, you know, (laughs) so somebody starts and I start the timer and it's my phone, right? It's going to beep in four minutes. And the other thing about it is it's like Alcoholics Anonymous is that when somebody is talking, whether it's they're holding the stick or the, you know, it's their time. Sure. No, nobody can interrupt. Right. Nobody can interject. It's just their time. Now. We almost violate that all the time, but it but at least it's a <laughs> it's a known shot. thing that you got to get in and get out with your little comment. Yeah, yeah. And so it's their time, but I think the thing that that assures everybody in the room and it might scare some people and it's all optional, 100%. You can pass your time. If it's your turn and you say I got nothing, it's nobody's judgment. Sure. Um so it's freedom, but there's at least the assurance that that person sitting on, like, if I start the circle and the person sitting, and it's going to my left, and the person sitting on my right, if they don't know for a fact that they're going to get their time, then I think they're going to listen less to the people that are talking, mm-hmm. or they're going to be pissed, or they're going to be scared, or I don't know, but it just assures them that they have their time. And so sure. everybody goes around, and what I do uh, as the pastor is, as I, to typically take notes. Hmm. And so I'll, I'll just put a couple of bullet points of what they said and, you know, the points they hit on. And then at 8 o'clock, uh, we break for bathroom break, refill your drink, refill your plate. And about 8.15, we, we rally back together in the, in the living room. And so now this is, this is open forum. This is not one at a time. There's no rules. There's no timer. This is just everybody talking. Ideally, about the same thing, not like broken off into three or four conversations at the same time, but but it's but it's free for all as far as talking. And so, what I might do if it, if it's a group of people that are not used to this, I might say I'll go back to the beginning and I'll say I'll say Brady, you know, when you shared, you talked about how your dog died and you're it's really fucked with you. And uh, has anybody ever lost an animal, you know, or whatever? Sure. And so, people find ways to connect, and that's from eight to nine. Okay. And then at nine o'clock, um, I you know it's not like anybody needs permission to leave. They can leave any fucking time they want. But right. uh, at nine o'clock, I say you know all right, it's nine o'clock. So you know you everybody we'll, we'll break it up from here. And and what ends up happening is people stay till ten, eleven, sometimes midnight. Mm-hmm. It just at that point it is just schmoozing and stuff. But it's very intentional. So that's once a month. Now I've got friends. That insist on weekly meetings, and I, sure. I, I'm not that guy. Right. Um, um, but what we do set out to do is we encourage each other to 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 try to do something extracurricular with someone in that month. So call somebody okay. and have lunch. Call somebody and go to a movie. Mm-hmm. Call somebody and go hiking. You know, call somebody and go kayaking. Um, so there's there's an intent at least. Yeah. So nobody's nobody's keeping score or anything like that. But it's an intent to do something outside of the monthly meeting. And in our case, the monthly meeting would rotate from house to house. Okay. So there'd be a different host each month. Okay. So I'm I'm just saying where the rubber meets the road, that's a way to do it. And mm. we did that with the same group of people for over four years. And the funny thing about monthly is you go, well, that's not very often. But that's that's what twelve times four is forty eight. That's forty eight intentional loaded meetings where probably somebody cried, sure. Where some you know where a lot of laughter went on. Something yeah, yeah, real yeah. fucking happened, right? And right. every time that you met together, you're you're going deeper with these people because you the more you trust them, the more you end up saying, you know, I'm going. I'm going to visit my parents, and they know they don't know that I've deconverted, and it's very, very hard, you know. And actually, that's that's that group that I'd started wasn't about that. I'll be honest with you. the 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 podcast groups they're about that, mm-hmm. but th- this group that I started with m- my wife and just local friends, yeah, everybody in the group was an unbeliever mm-hmm. um, or an ex-believer of some sort, 
but but we were beyond talking about that. Sure, we were, we're yeah we were. We were over that in a way, mm-hmm. and that's the thing about I don't know if you guys know this, but I because I've been deconverted for almost ten years, and I've been doing the show for over four, and that's a weekly show. So there's over four hundred hours under my belt of talking to people about deconversion, and you know I got a a divinity degree, you know, um, so right, I'm right, right. I am I have no well somebody might call me call bullshit on this, but what I was about to say was I have no. Um, drama or trauma around my ex, my my deconversion. Sure, I'm over it. I'm I'm you know I, I don't I don't need counseling for it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, um, I would say that I'm over the anger, but that's already come up two or three times in this show, and that's what people would call <laughs> bullshit. On, so. We'll call you out on that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on the air. So that's my you know that's my spiel on community. I love I like it. That. I I, um, I I love that you. I, I first of all, thanks for sharing like details about how you do it because that's that's valuable information to get wheels spinning for people because it's not like I mean like you said that's a way to do it. It's not like every yeah. like anybody can figure out any kind of way or or, or like process that they want to go about to do it. But the point is, I mean, it sounds like to me the point is intentionality seems to be like Absolutely. the theme, right? It's it's right. like this is time where we can goof off, but we also are giving everybody time to intentionally talk about whatever it is they're going through and then intentionally respond to it, intentionally spend time thinking about it. And that makes people feel valued. That makes people feel like they're a part of thing, a, a mm-hmm. thing. It makes them feel loved. And, you know, it doesn't matter what your process is. The, the point is, like, create an environment where people can feel like they belong because that's what, that's what church was for us for so yeah. many years, was a place where we knew no matter what that we belonged Right, uh, you know, even if even if like Brady is gay, right? In, in in a lot of ways, he didn't belong, but still received support and things like that from the church community. We can recreate that, but where you don't have to be alienated for things that <laughs> you're yeah. going through, with things that you can't change about yourself, right? Mm. Well, well, well. Go back in time and now look look at what my wife said when she said we could we could m- up and move tomorrow, and I wouldn't shed a tear. Well, today, if we were to move. It would be devastating. Right, 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 right. It, yeah. Just because of the depths of the roots that we have in this town. In fact, when Bob Pondillo, my co-host, who was also a part of my book club, mm-hmm. he and his wife, um, she was a high school teacher, he was a college professor, and he retired a couple of years before she did, but she just re- she retired from high school teaching, and her family was up in... Uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and they were they were leaving, and I'm the 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 going away party that we had for them. This book club, like fifteen twenty people, um, was just gut wrenching. I mean, as far as how much we are going to miss those people, and so I'm just saying that it flipped from being like I could leave and not shed a tear to where we really feel some depth here. And the Very second cool. thing I want to stress awesome. about about intentionality is if you're going to do this. It, it's somebody's got to be the dick in a way. I mean, it's like because the truth oh, is, sure. is that people are people are gonna. I, I'm not I, after four years of doing it with that one group of people. Everybody still kind of whined and called me the timer Nazi. Uh huh. Sure. But at the end of the day, they, when they, I'm telling you, when they got in their car and went home, they had, for lack of a better word, warm fuzzies. You know, I mean, like they. They were they were fulfilled, enriched, and there's no fucking way they would have had that if we're just talking about Trump. We're just talking about the the Dallas Cowboys. Right. We're right, just right. talking about. I mean, right. Or getting drunk. I mean, it's just it's superficial it's, and shallow. Fa- facilitation Com- is important, right? It's, it is. I, I I'm I'm a believer in that. So I know this is crazy, and I'm sitting there looking <laughs> at, at you, Brady, and you're triggered by all of this because you've been quiet for 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, I don't know, like. It, it is hard for me to, to look at it because recently I went to uh, somebody's house and it was like a weekly get together thing that they do. And I, I brought my son with me, but it was kind of a potluck. And it was hard for me because it, it brought back a lot of shit from the church that I got out of that was yeah. Uh, yeah. very intentional about those things. So I realize I just don't, I don't thrive necessarily in 
close quarters with a bigger group of people very much. So no, for thank me, you. thank you for saying that That's for awesome. me, what I've been able to do is uh, like, I'll have one-on-one conversations with people or go get coffee or have them come over to my house or something like that. So like I'm, I have that sort of intentional thing and we always end up, end up getting in deeper conversations because I guess that's just how I'm wired to a fault, you know? Um, but it makes sense. I mean, I think that there are aspects of having a community like that of like five or six people who are meeting on a regular basis that um, I definitely miss and uh, would love to be able to get back to somehow mm-hmm. uh, in a way that like feels natural for us. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah, I do know what you mean, but be careful that you don't wait for it to be that natural because sometimes it's not going to happen naturally. Sometimes right, right. that's kind of my point is it takes some intention. However, I really appreciate you saying that because about half of your listeners just just identified with you because they were completely triggered by everything that I just said. But it's like and what that, you said earlier about binary thinking. It, it it's doesn't, not binary. It doesn't yeah. have to be a Cass or a Brady. This yeah, is yeah. like Thank you. Yeah. You know, everybody I'm has Cass, different. By the way. I did. <laughs> okay, here, here's a here's a side note. Whenever I was accused of being like, there was kids in the youth group that were uh, part of my intense discipleship group, and the other groups that like didn't like them or resented them, they called them Castians. <laughs> oh my god! Like uh, mine called themselves the Brady Bunch, but it was the just Brady kind of, Bunch. My name was asking. That was for easy. Yeah. Too easy. So, so Cast, that was. Uh, are you? Were you guys? Are you done? Are you done with your? I think that was. I don't want to yeah, interrupt no, you. Yeah, no, okay. I'm good. Sorry, because I wanted to ask Cass one more question before we before we call it a day. Um, your podcast is called uh, Everyone's Agnostic, and I really, mm-hmm. really, really like that. I mean, just immediately it was like, oh yeah, I resonate with that. What does that? What exactly does that mean to you? And well, in, in so many words. Yeah, it's funny that you would say that it resonated with you. Like as soon as you heard it, so I, I would say this about. The, the spectrum that is the atheist community. Um, I had um, the the director of American Atheists, um, David Silverman, on the show, and he's a firebrand, what we, what we call firebrand atheists. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, they've never <laughs> the they've never had they've never shed a tear for Jesus. They've never had a heart for. Uh, to, these are these are the type of atheists that all religionists are stupid. Uh-huh. And they don't they don't mean to do it, and in fact they they resist it as best they can. But at the end of the day, they can't they can't see it any other way. Mm. That you if you believe that shit, there's something very stupid about you, or at least there was at that phase of your mm-hmm. life. You mm-hmm. were you were duped. Yeah, and I don't relate to it. I if the first time somebody you know passed a plate or made made me do it. A certain thing, or tried to lay hands on me, or ask me to speak in tongues, I'd say "fuck you" and walk out the back door. Mm-hmm. You know, and so they don't relate to those of us that got pulled in, drank the Kool Aid, etc. Mm. And the reason I even mention that here is that to that type of atheist, everywhere that I've been in these circles, because I, I go to atheist conventions and stuff sometimes, and I realize that, and I hate to say this because it sounds like us and them or elitists, but for the most part, those aren't my people. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. I don't really relate to them, and uh, I, I don't. It's it's okay. I mean, it's it, but they always they always hate the name of my show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They they are offended <laughs> yeah, by yeah, the yeah. name of my show. They come in and say, "I'm not an agnostic, right? You know, I, I know I'm an atheist. You know, sure, sure. So I always know who I'm dealing with in a way when somebody comes on and or like yourself and says, you know, when I heard that name, I was like, yeah, but but at the same time, I could have easily have named it. Everyone's an atheist because when it comes to like a Christian doesn't believe in Allah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So when it comes to Allah, they don't believe in that God. So sure. they are an atheist or an Allah atheist or something. You know how mm-hmm. you say that. And somebody from another religion doesn't believe that Jehovah is God or Jesus is God. And so when it comes to all the world gods, the, the everybody's an atheist except they're just one God shy of us. You know. Sure. So it's just. I guess what I'm saying <laughs> <You're right. laughs> is I'd like to find commonality. I'd like to find common ground. And any time a person comes to the table with certainty up their ass, they're never 
they're not going to listen. They're not going to engage. Right. They're going to feel superior. They're not going to sympathize, empathize, or have any compassion for the yeah. other person's position. And so you might as well not be together. And hmm. I, I'm, I'm just convinced that as long as somebody – and I'm a, I'm a huge advocate, and I can't go through a show without saying his name – Ernest Becker's book, The Denial of Death. Okay. His theory is that because we, unlike any other animal, we are self-aware of our own impending death, that we're scared shitless of it, and we're scared shitless of the fact that our life is meaningless. Mm. And so in order to help us get out of bed every day and compartmentalize that horror, we find ways to give our lives meaning, to Mm -hmm. identify with people, and try to associate ourselves with winning teams. Like the reason that half the people that love the uh, Alabama Tide have never attended college, Uh you know, but they but they want to identify with a winning program. Sure. Or if somebody says, you know, not only do I want to swim, but I want a gold medal, mm-hmm. because they want to leave their name in the books. If they, Some people have children so that they leave a legacy, and, right. it's, and, and it makes their life non, non-meaningless. And so there's this kicking and scratching. So if you identify with what he calls an immortality project, in this case Christianity or whatever, sure. and it's your... Oh, that's good you, language. Right, so you've invested in it. You've said, "Oh, this is the way to live forever, and that I'm not going to rot in 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 the ground or in hell." Sure, I'm going to go on and fly, and etc. And and when you meet somebody who has completely invested in a different uh, e- e- uh, immortality project, then it's an instant affront. It's instantly a threat because what if theirs is right? Sure. And so it literally, instead of it just yeah. being like, oh, that's great that you believe that, mm. those are fighting words, because now I am bordering on meaninglessness again. Right. You've brought, right, right, right. You brought that to the fore of my mind. Sure. And if, if you're right, or if you're right, don't... Oh, uh, or if you know Dallas Cowboys are better than the Miami Dolphins, or if, sure, or if, I'm, sure. if I get a silver medal instead of a gold medal, yeah. I'm reminded of my, of my failure, my meaninglessness, my, my emptiness... My mm. impending death is my life. I mean, none of us, none of us, ex- unless we're Martin Luther King Jr. in the encyclopedia, are going to be remembered a hundred years from now. Sure, by yeah, anybody yeah. Right, on right, the right. planet, nobody's <laughs> going to know or care that we were ever here. Right, and that sucks, or that that's insulting, or whatever. Yeah. And so we kick and scratch to have meaning and to, to align ourselves with a winning program or, or or an immortality project that is the right one and that's why wars are fought over this shit because mm. it's your your god has to be right wow and, and, and you know et cetera et cetera so uh, by saying this starting with the phrase hey you know what none of us really know uh we don't have to know i don't have to know mystery is cool in fact it's kind of really cool because it makes the fact that the leaves change every fall, mm-hmm. not because not because somebody designed it so, you know, but because evolution or science or or you know whatever. So, sure. just just the freedom to like, um, you know, another book that I love is the Sacred Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Is uh-huh. is picking picking your battles better, and yep. and just saying, okay, this is not a hill to die on. I love it when my kids were young and they were fighting, and they're fighting over like. Uh, um, the, the the stapler, sure, okay, <laughs> uh, and 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 they were like you know ready to go to fisticuffs over who gets to play with the stapler next, and the you know we'll I just say like toys well, man, yeah. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> go buy some toys, but it's like what's what's more important people or things or you know whatever like try to help mm. people pick their battles better sure. of course like the stapler's meaningless and yet your sister your brother is much more meaningful so you know aim a little higher. <laughs> In your priorities, mm. anyway, that's a long way around saying I that's love why it. I named I, the The reason I, I I love that I love that response. I love the the phrase. Um, oh, what was it? Immortality project. Immortal. Yes, immortality projects. God, that's brilliant. Um, I, the reason that the the phrase really resonated with me is because I hear a lot of our listeners talking about shame that they feel because they were duped, you know, and sort of in the way that you were saying, like, Absolutely. atheist thinkers out there. I mean, like, you know, the one of the first people that, like, deconstructed Christians read is Richard Dawkins, who will just make you feel incredibly stupid, you know? Yeah. He's just yeah. a very angry man. And so, like, I, I love that because it's like, dude, 
we were we all just like woke up one day and like you said started like feeling and tasting things and getting an idea for where the fuck we are and yeah. none of us have the slightest clue and, and we shouldn't and go around acting like this. we do and i'm yeah. i'm way more of an advocate for people admitting that they what they don't know than i am for it admitting what or you know talking about what we do know in yeah. this conversation you know it, it's it's important to talk about both but let's start with like look dude like i believed in this god for a long time and i'm pretty sure it's not real anymore but that doesn't mean that that this camp is right or this camp is right or this camp is right or what richard dawkins said about me is true you know yeah it just yeah. means that that in my experience that god is no longer a relevant part of my life you know and you yeah. you were duped sure yeah we all were but like you, that doesn't mean that you know any more or less than literally anybody else. But we're yeah. kind of uniquely, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Uniquely qualified to empathize with people who came from that, who do feel that stupid. And so right. if one of those atheists that you were talking about who is, seems kind of heartless about it, um, they can't talk to people with our backgrounds right. the same way that we can. And so right. I kind of look at myself now as like the duck build platypus that i could be you know the thing in between both the ducks and the i don't know what is the other side of the platypus uh it's like a uh, <laughs> beaver beaver, a, a beaver. Yeah. yeah there we go <laughs> so you know uh i'm kind of like able to be the savior of both of those because i'm right in the middle wow uh, just like you know god and human i'm basically jesus of the um ex-evangelicals the official mascot uh, of of savior. the life after is... thank you yeah yeah, the platypus. I'm going the by platypus savior. Is the, yeah. Oh, that I thought you meant me as <laughs> as the as the cult leader. Yeah, that's what I was going for. Savior. I'm going for savior. The word is savior. Okay, Thank we'll you. do that. Thanks. Well, it, we're, we're, I'm going. I've always, you know, it's not something I necessarily aspired to, but it's something that just it just kind of comes out of my wheelhouse naturally, and that's like a build a bridge builder, uh, an orchestrator oh, yeah. of things, and sure. that, you know that Beavers. manifested as pastoral and stuff, but in within a in a religionless world. Oh, bridge builders, it, not dam builders. I mean, same I thing. forgot. You're okay, fine. Sorry, no, you're go fine. Ahead. I thought that was a good Yeah, analogy. bridge builder. I was and thinking that's, of that's what you're saying <laughs> is that you're, you can, you can communicate with somebody, you know, in a way that you're, you're, you're compassionate towards the fact that they believed at one point. In their yes. Life, yes. But you're also okay with the fact that they don't anymore because you've are you're, you're with them in that, in that journey. Well, you know what I'm and, working on? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And the, the only thing that affords us the privilege, or I should say, well, of of judgment is distance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. You, you, oh, abs you know, yeah. No, I, absolutely. Yeah. And so, if you're a bridge builder, you're bringing people together. You're, you're, you know, I don't know. It's a beautiful thing, and and uh, uh, it's, it's a lot of this stuff is the same. The same things that drew me to Jesus drew me past him. You know, because yeah. it was love, it was connection, it was compassion, right? It was. And then it was yeah, like, you know. wow, that was you really half-assed that Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> mine were taking so taking by, like taking things literally uh, right, right. to like an almost yeah. like is Brady on the spectrum sort of way, <laughs> and then that's what got me to get out. Yeah. Well, yeah, and once I got over the pride of thinking for myself, I mean, one of my last statements to God was, you know, I'm never going to bow the knee to a God that's not at least as good as I am. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's awesome. I love that. On that note, no, not no. Cass Midgley, host, uh, co-host of uh, of everyone's, uh, agnostic. everyone's agnostic. What's your your co-host name? Maria. M Marie Delafont. Marie, Marie Delafont. Very cool. Everybody's got cool names on their show. We just have Chuck Parson and Brady <laughs> Harden. Uh, Cass Midgley and Diglo <laughs> Fibliono <laughs> and his new replacement. <laughs> Marie Bigly enough for no 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 so no, and he's even got the California voice actor to say it. Yeah, uh, uh, check yeah. check out the uh, funny story actually. In that sitcom that I used to be on, uh, we had a voice actor from California come in and do the previously art completing cadence. <laughs> but the strange thing he also just it in. <laughs> he was the voice um, of one of the characters' dads, so we never saw him. We just heard him like like when, in peanuts. When one, no, one episode, wah, he goes, wah, wah, wah. He, wah, goes wah, wah, wah. Um, he goes, Leanne, come in here. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Sorry, that was my story. Thanks, Go Brady. Ahead. You're welcome. We're in, well, we're in maybe light. you guys can come on my show sometime. <laughs> I would love it. I'd love that. We would, yeah, let's do it. Uh, Cass, thanks Check for being on out. the show. Thanks for oh, your thanks time. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, it was a blast. Yeah, you, this is a lot of fun. Thanks so much. Um, 
listen listen to everyone's agnostic enjoy it um please find us go ahead oh go ahead well i was gonna switch it i was gonna say to go on to yeah on our show you know itunes and all that to (laughs) uh rate review subscribe and also do it to everyone's agnostic yep yeah absolutely subscribe and review and uh support and be a promoter and hey remember if you don't go to church sunday Sunday is is just just a second second Saturday. saturday